Today we're going to learn about two preachers. That's right, two preachers. Two people who, uh, who walked with Jesus 24-7 for three years. Heard everything he said, saw every miracle he did, even were delegated the power to do miracles and sent out to preach concerning him. One of them is in heaven. The other one is in hell. They had life in common together and ended up as separated as anyone can possibly be forever. It's a fascinating story. Stay with us. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. As we come to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew, I, I, I want to introduce to you two familiar men and maybe introduce them to you in a way that you haven't seen them in the past. It's a tale of two men in this chapter. While when you read Matthew 26 and on into chapter 27, you are focused on the Lord Jesus Christ who dominates these chapters as He goes to the cross. Uh, these are the accounts of uh, His uh, arrest and mock trial and scourging and execution on the cross. Because the, the light is so bright on Christ, because it's such a dominating figure, you can lose sight of, of a tale of two men that is going on at the very same time. And it's a very remarkable, remarkable tale. It, it fascinates me that these two men are the secondary characters in this chapter and there really are no others. It's Jesus and these two men. You know them very well. They both had the most unique privilege and opportunity ever given to a human being, ever, N never to be given to anyone before or since. Both were personally called by Jesus to follow Him. Both answered the call and followed Him 24-7 for three years, every day, all day, and every night, all night, virtually. Both declared repeatedly to Him and to those around them their personal devotion to the Lord Jesus. Both were personally trained by Jesus for ministry. Both were students of Jesus. They were in that all-day-long classroom called discipleship. Both of them were being trained for ministry. Both of them were taught by Jesus, the unparalleled teacher, the most profound teacher that ever walked on earth. They were taught by Him in ways that they could understand that which was profound and unknown to the world. They were taught by precept, proposition, and they were taught by example to know the Word of God and to know the will of God and to know the truth concerning all things. They were given a divine world view. They were taught how to respond to the truth of God and live it out obediently. Both men saw the miracles of Jesus every day throughout the duration of His ministry. They saw His power over demons. They saw His power over disease. They saw His power over death. They saw His power over nature. They saw His intellectual power to deflect every assault on Him from His enemies that came verbally as they tried to catch Him in His words. They saw the mastery that He had of the language and of truth and thought. Both men heard the Lord answer every important 
penetrating, profound theological question ever asked of Him, and uh, they no doubt heard Him answer questions that no one asked. And the answers were always true and profound and clear. Both of them were daily confronted with their sinfulness. Both of them were daily reminded that they had fallen as the whole human race had and were desperately in need of forgiveness and salvation. They were very aware of that. Both of them understood that Jesus had come to proclaim good news to sinners. Both of them received and used divine power. Power from Jesus and authority from Jesus was delegated to them so that both of them were enabled to do miracles and to exercise power and authority over demons. Eventually both of them were sent out to preach. Both of them became preachers, and they preached that the Messiah, Jesus, was the Savior and the Son of God and the King. And they shared all the experiences together for those amazing three years. They were exposed to the Lord Jesus Christ in exactly the same way, the same experiences, the same period of time. There's more. They both were sinners, and they knew it. They knew it well. They both felt profound guilt about their sin, overwhelming guilt about their sin. There's more. They both were taken over by Satan, both of them, to take up Satan's cause against the Lord Jesus. And in the end, they both betrayed Him publicly, violently, strongly, openly, they betrayed Him. And they did that at the end of that three years, just before He was crucified. As a result of what they did, both were sad, sorry. In fact, they agonized over their betrayals. Both of them did. One. was so agonized that he killed himself. The other was so agonized that he repented. Two men whose lives were side by side in the presence of the Son of God. One of them, in spite of his wicked betrayal of the Savior, is considered so honorable and so exalted a person that some of you are named after Him. In fact, people have been named after Him since the first century, and people will continue to be named after this betrayer. He is loved. His name is honored. And His name is Peter. The word doesn't mean anything particularly important. It's the word for stone. The other man is considered so dishonorable, the other betrayer is so despicable that no one has his name. You don't know anyone who has his name. You don't know anyone's dog who has his name. <laughs> he is hated, he is reviled, he is rejected, he is Judas. And His name means praised. Such an elevated name for such a dishonorable man. One of these men, we who belong to Christ, will meet because that betrayer is in heaven. The other, you who reject Christ, may meet because He's in hell. One of these preachers ended a suicide. 
hanging himself and not even doing that successfully. The book of Acts tells us that uh, his end came when he fell and was disemboweled on the rocks below. Whether the branch broke, the rope broke, or the knot was inadequate, he was a tragic suicide, eternally banished. The other ended his life a saint, crucified upside down and eternally blessed. Two men, side by side, for three years, experiencing exactly the same thing in the presence of the glorious Son of God, together ended up as separated as two human beings can be, one in heaven and one in hell. That separation may be portrayed a little bit in the listing of the apostles in the four places the apostles are listed in the New Testament. Peter is the first name and Judas is the last. Even there, they are as separated as far as they can be. One highly honored in heaven, the other highly dishonored in hell. What an amazing contrast. And they both had the same experience with Jesus Christ. Their lives, in that sense, couldn't have been more similar, and their ends couldn't have been more dissimilar. What made the difference? Why does Peter end up in heaven and Judas in hell? Well, the answer is very simple. They had different attitudes toward Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. Salvation isn't by works, they did the same works. It isn't by knowledge, they had the same knowledge. They were given the same information. Salvation can be basically boiled down to a person's attitude toward Jesus Christ. To put it simply, Peter loved Him and Judas hated Him. And they came out of the same context. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Just to contemporize that a little bit, churches are full of the same kinds of people today. Churches are full of Peters and Judases, all hearing the same messages, hearing the same truth, same doctrine, same explanation of Scripture, having the same spiritual experience in the fellowship seeing the same divine grace and power in the same people's lives, serving together, worshiping together, evangelizing together, and they end up in two extremely different places. Uh, Jesus pointed this out when He talked about the wheat and the tares, didn't He? And also in the Sermon on the Mount when He said, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. The story of these two men, two kinds of sorrow, really, is found in the 26th chapter of Matthew. Let me take you to that chapter, and we're going to cover the whole chapter by moving rapidly. Jesus has just finished His great second coming sermon given on the Mount of Olives, the last sermon He gave to His disciples. He's reminded them that He is going to be returning to establish His kingdom. He'll come back in glory, finishes that up, chapter 26, verse 1, and then says to His disciples, verse 2, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. He was the final and only satisfying Passover lamb. He would offer His life at the Passover as the true Passover lamb the true sacrifice for sin that God would accept. He is telling them about His coming death. It is very soon. Passover is coming. In fact, it's coming the next day. The Son of Man is going to be handed over for crucifixion. This isn't the first time He had told them that. He has been talking about that for a long time. 
If you go all the way back to chapter 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And that's when, of course, Peter said, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. But Jesus had been saying all along, I'm headed for death. I'm headed for crucifixion. He was even specific about the way He would die. So Jesus is saying the time has come, and in the meantime, verses 3 to 5 tell us the rulers of Israel were planning it. They were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill Him. So they're working on hatching the plot while Jesus is telling them that it is coming. At this time, they find themselves in Bethany, according to verse 6, two miles from Jerusalem east over the Mount of Olives, little village of Bethany. Uh, there were a couple of Christian families there. Simon the leper was one, no doubt a man who had been healed from leprosy, and Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in that little village. So Jesus was there in Bethany, and He was at the home of Simon the leper, and a woman came to Him with an alabaster vial, a very expensive vial, a very costly perfume. This would have been a small fortune in this bottle and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. Uh, this was an act of lavish affection and love for the Lord. Verse 8 says, the disciples were indignant when they saw this and they said, why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Sounds noble, doesn't it? Sounds really noble. Who, who would have said that? John 12, 4 says it was Judas. It was Judas. He was the protester. And by the way, this is the first revelation of this man's heart. Oh, earlier in John 6, uh, verse 70, Jesus said, one of you is a devil. But that must have flown by because He didn't say who. And I'm sure that, that because there was zero suspicion among them of each other, they, they didn't even process it. Here is the first revelation of His character, and there is no suspicion of Him whatsoever. He brings it up, why are you wasting this? We could have sold it and given the money to the poor. He didn't care about the poor. Not at all. Another gospel writer tells us he said this because he had the bag. He had the money. This thing was going downhill fast. Judas had gotten in as a greedy, self-loving, ambitious man who saw Jesus as the means to his own satisfaction. He wanted money. He was driven by greed and avarice and worldliness. He wanted prominence, power. He wanted to gain everything he could gain for himself, and he saw Jesus as the way to do that. And now Jesus is not talking about a kingdom, not talking about power, not talking about being exalted. He's talking about death. And in verse 12, he takes it a step further and says that what this woman did, in a sense, is symbolic as a preparation for my burial. Jews would anoint bodies. They didn't embalm them, but they would anoint them in burial. Here was like a preliminary symbol of the fact that he was going to be dead and buried. Judas is in a panic. He's got whatever he's got in the bag, and they made him the treasurer. That's how much they trusted him and how little suspicion, virtually none, there was of him as a hypocrite. And now, because he knows he's going to get out, he wants to get out with whatever he can. He wishes that this had been sold so the money could go in the bag because he held the bag and it would just give him back some compensation for having his ladder leaning against the wrong building for three years. He is crushed. His ambitions are smashed. He is terribly disappointed and he is angry at Jesus. Verse 14 says, one of the twelve, and that's how he's always introduced in the four gospels because it's so incredulous that he's in that group and acting this way. One of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. According to Exodus 21, 32, that's the price of a slave. That's the price of a slave. Please notice the word betray in verse 15. What are you willing to give me to betray Him to you? They were afraid to go arrest Jesus in the middle of the day because He was 
mobbed by the people and he was popular with the people. They needed to get him at night, but how could they find him in the dark of night where there were no lights in the ancient world? Somebody had to reveal where he was. Judas said, I'll do that for the price of a slave. Verse 16, from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Verse 17 introduces us to the Passover on that Thursday night where Jesus gathers to celebrate what had been inaugurated in the twelfth chapter of Exodus, the celebration of the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. They were going to hold the Passover, celebrate the Passover. They get together for that very event. It's indicated there in verses 17 and following. Verse 20 says, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. Now out of nowhere as they were eating, He says, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray Me. One of you will betray Me. Shock beyond imagination. Shock. I could say the same thing today. Some of you will betray Jesus Christ. You will defect. You will deny Him finally and terminally in a group this size. But among the twelve, one of you will betray Me? There is no suspicion about Judas. They're all deeply grieved. They each one began to say to Him, surely not I, Lord. They were more suspicious of themselves than they were of Him. There was no suspicion directed at Judas. And the Lord answered, He who dipped His bread with Me in the bowl is the one who will betray Me. One right here at this table. The Old Testament says, My own familiar friend, He will betray Me. The Son of Man is to go, verse 24, as is written of Him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Never have... never having been born, far better fate than eternity in hell. And Judas, keeping up the hypocrisy who was betraying Him, said, surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, you've said it yourself. And he is only at the last hour finally exposed as the betrayer. At this point, John's gospel tells us Judas was dismissed. John says Satan entered him. John 13, 2 and 27, Satan entered him. And Jesus said, go do what you do quickly, get out. And Judas leaves. And they have the Passover with Judas gone. After the Passover, go down to verse 30, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. They went out to the Mount of Olives. Passover was done, they went there to pray. And if you go down to verse 36, that's exactly what happened. They came to Gethsemane, which means olive press. He told uh, the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and James and John. He began to be grieved and distressed and you know he went there to pray. So the disciples are now in Gethsemane, Peter and John a little further in into the garden, Jesus a little further in praying alone, and here we pick up the story of Judas after he left, after he left. He goes out and negotiates his deal with the leaders of Israel for thirty pieces of silver. He knows where they are in the familiar place in the garden on the Mount of Olives. And so we pick up the story in verse 45. Then He came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Remember they kept sleeping instead of praying. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's be going. Behold, the one who betrays Me is at hand. Judas has arrived. And now we look at the man Judas. 
Verse 47, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. He's got a massive group of hundreds of people, including the temple police, the Roman soldiers, the leaders of Israel, all the elite religiosity purveyors of that apostate form of Judaism. They're all there to arrest him in the night away from the crowds. And Judas has given them a sign. Verse 48, he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one sees him. There's some profound anger in that. There's some profound bitterness in that. There's hatred in that. Immediately, Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kept on kissing Him, kissed Him repeatedly. And Jesus said to him, friend, and it's not the word for friend that is most used to refer to that. It's not the kind of friend that you think of as an intimate friend. It's the word for associate or comrade. It's a more indifferent word. It's a more distant word. Uh, Comrade or associate, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized Him. It's really unbelievable what Judas has done. Verse 57 says, when they had seized him, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. They were gathered together in this phony trial with false accusations. They tried to bribe witnesses to lie about him, verse 59, trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they could have a reason to put him to death. They couldn't get people who could get their story together, though many people tried because they would be paid if they could. Finally, some people came along and said He was going to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days, which He said at the beginning of His ministry. And uh, this mock trial went from the high priest to Herod to Pilate, and you know all the phases of that trial. The final adjudication, the high priest, verse 65, tears his robes. He's blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And here's the final verdict on Jesus. He deserves to die. They sentence him to death. It's the death penalty. Then they spat in his face, beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said mockingly, of course, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? That's the outcome of what Judas did. That's the outcome for Jesus of His betrayal. If you'd like to know more about other apostles who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ from their heart, get John's book, 12 Ordinary Men. Go to gty.org or call us at 1-800-55-GRACE. Next time on Grace to You. Two men, side by side, for three years, experiencing exactly the same thing in the presence of the glorious Son of God, together ended up as separated as two human beings can be, one in heaven and one in hell. Judas, for whom Jesus was a disappointment, whom he resented if not hated, Peter, for whom Jesus was a Savior whom he loved. How you feel about Christ, how you view Him, will determine your heaven or your hell.